Hello, <clears throat> I'm uh, artist and uh, author Mark Heine from Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, this is video number 12, the last of the Elements of Painting uh, video series, I believe, um, because we're getting close to the end of the slideshow that I put together to describe all these Elements of Paintings, Elements of Painting. And uh, so let's go right to the slideshow, just do a screen share here. And there we go, where we left off in video number 11 was the subject of perspective. And um, here's the thing about perspective. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows perspective. Not everyone knows how to do it, but everyone can sense it because we all live in the world and we all go out for a walk and we can see that buildings uh, angle at certain ways depending on how tall they are and how, how flat they are and your viewpoint on them. So <clears throat> a sense of perspective is something that everybody has. And if you get it wrong, the viewer will look at it and go, that's wrong. I don't know why that's wrong, but that's wrong. And uh, so it becomes one of these things that they may not be able to identify, but for sure they'll see that it's wrong. Now, I'm not talking about doing, uh, you know, plotting out a, a horizon line with vanishing points and, 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 and creating a, 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 a painting that is a mathematical, <clears throat> exactly perfect uh, perspective exercise uh my father this is one of his paintings uh was uh, in his early career an architectural renderer so certainly he knows how to plot uh uh a perspective and i've done it a lot myself in in my early years as as an illustrator <clears throat> single point multiple point perspective uh, it's all something that that uh, you have to get uh used to in, in in terms of creating but when you're out and especially when you're out field sketching like if you're out sketching on location and you're looking at a scene um you really have to and you can you can tell where the horizon is by the angles of the the buildings and they may not necessarily all be lined up in a grid uh like in this particular case uh these these uh, buildings are not necessarily lined up square to each other but they all have the same common horizon so if you look at this building here it it the slope of this roof vanishes down to a point over here that would be the this vanishing point and the same vanishing point if that building is square to the cathedral in the background this line here will go down to that same vanishing point and and so you know this this line here even that little tiny bit of roof and this longer bit of roof has to go down to that same horizon and the same vanishing point uh and this line here you can see that it's it's less angled than than this line this line is higher as you go higher that line still has to the lines up here still have to like the point of that and the point of that still have to line up to that same vanishing point over here, which is the same vanishing point off of all these lines. So everything goes down to the same point. And, and this line too, because it's closer to the horizon, it goes down at a, a slightly slower angle, but it still goes to the same point. So you can tell where the horizon is in a, in a viewpoint or in a, in a scene, because this line is vanishing down and this line is going up. So we take that line, you draw it up there, and where it meets this line, that's where your vanishing point is. Some or right around there. So, or sorry, that's where your horizon is, right around there. So these, these see these this line of windows here, it's kind of on the horizon. So they're not really sloping. They're flatter. And this line here is it's flat too. It's sloping up a bit. So this is sloping down a hair. That's sloping up a hair. So the bottom of those windows pretty much is the horizon. And all objects in this painting have to refer to the same around, uh, same horizon in this case. So if you have 
a sense of perspective, a sense of how the mechanics of it work. As you're drawing on location, you can you can fake it. You know that this building, this line here is going to be not quite as sloping as this line here because this one's higher. By getting that sense of perspective uh, as a secondary thing that, that you, you don't really need to think about because you're thinking already about a whole bunch of other stuff, including, uh, you know, what the shape of the building is and scale and proportion and stuff. You got lots of things to think about. So having perspective as a, as almost a, 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 a an underlying uh, knowledge that you don't necessarily have to think about so much. Uh, it, it, you're just aware of it. Uh, that, that can really uh, help. And, and you really need to know, uh, perspective uh, to do landscape, uh, certainly buildings, uh, or at least have a sense of it so that it's roughly right. Um, and then also you can exaggerate perspective. So so if you want to make something look taller, you can cheat perspective. So these there's things you can do uh, once you're familiar with perspective, you can you can learn how to manipulate it and play with it like the other elements of painting that. Um, uh, become a tool for you. So perspective is a, an important thing to know. Oops, we got audio. Sorry. Okay. Let me pause this here. Um, <clears throat> distortion. So this painting here, uh, is my daughter, Sarah, again, in the swing. Uh, and it's called, Hey, there's a tiger on my lap because I, I asked her, what would you call this painting? And she had this little stuffed tiger sitting on her lap. And uh, and so she said, hey, there's a tiger on my lap. And I said, OK, that's a good title. So that's the title of this painting. Uh, and um, I distorted her legs out way longer than they are in real life uh, or were in real life. Um, you know, I'm playing around with distortion and 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 uh, and that worked in this painting. So, you know, that's another thing that you can play with another uh, thing that you can adjust and I'll quite often uh, adjust the proportions of a figure uh, in a painting uh, to be the way I want it to be uh, and uh, that's something that is in my control which again is one of the things in the toolbox and in their element so distortion is is something fun to have motion effects you know I've I've, I've got some motion effects in this particular painting where I've kind of lost the edges here, blurred some edges to create a, a sense of motion. So this is different than implied motion, like the underwater stuff where everything is almost a freeze frame of multiple motions that are happening. This is more of a uh, an indication or a visual indication of, of, of a motion, more of an effect than it is a... a, 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 a a, a capture of a, of a still motion. So anyway, motion effects, something you can play with. Um, it's another tool. And next in the, oh, well, there we go. Captured motion. I, I've kind of talked about this in previous videos, but again, underwater, there's all kinds of motion happening. Uh, we've got in this particular one, I've, I've kind of exaggerated this, this, uh, these uh, rays of light that come through the the wind driven uh, ripples and riffles up top and create this this sense of motion. Here we have perspective again, right? These mo these lines, see this line here running up is going to go to a vanishing point that's way up there somewhere, and this line here is going to go to the same vanishing point. So all these all these rays are all coming from the sun, which is one point or vanishing point and then they radiate down and they have to radiate out from the same point to create that effect um so we're getting some some sense of motion from the the sunlight we're getting sense of motion from the bubbles you know the bubbles are going to be floating uh their way up sense of motion in the reflection that's happening above it uh sense of motion in the suspension of gravity with the fabric floating and the hair floating. So captured motion is really kind of not an effect of 
of, uh, of blurring edges and creating this visual motion effect. It's almost like a, a, a freeze frame capturing the inherent motion in the painting and the subject that you're that you're working on. So something that you can play with. And again, a lot of this was was emphasized uh, or or over emphasized to to create a point in, in in this painting. So captured motion is a fun one to play with. Surreal elements. Uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about this in, in other parts in the series. Um, this um, painting here, uh, you know, clearly we've got you know some surreal elements happening, and and you know the way that things evolve in a storyline. Uh, I came up with the concept for this visual and did the painting, and then had to adapt the writing in the story to uh, to include the painting. So sometimes the painting drives the story, sometimes the story drives the painting, which is a kind of a fun way to work. And, um, and in this case, uh, this becomes an underwater version of uh, the beast uh, from uh, Minoan mythology uh, on Crete uh, called the um, Minotaur. And the Minotaur was a half bull, had the head of a bull, head of a bull and body of a man. Uh, and it lived in a what's called a labyrinth underneath the palace of Gnosis in Crete. And I've been there a few times, taken some some students there. So it's a really fascinating mythology. And, uh, and in the storyline, this particular creature becomes, it's a, a creature that, that is, uh, it creates a lot of fear, but in terms, it, but but that fear is unfounded because it's just the way the creature looks. But in fact, the creature has a different kind of heart or a different heart than the way it looks. So it's judging a book by its cover kind of thing. And the reason that 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 it's this minotaur creature is that there's another painting in the series called Labyrinth. And the labyrinth refers to, of course, the 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 palace of Gnosis and the, the maze underneath the the maze where the Minotaur lived. But this is the the water version of the palace uh, or the maze, which is a a maze of uh, in a kelp bed uh, uh, off the, the in the ocean where uh, this particular creature lives uh, within this maze of of dense kelp and winds up actually being a positive part of the story so anyway surreal elements when you're doing um storytelling uh they can be a lot of fun to uh to include and uh and you know when you're sitting there working trying to figure out what you're going to paint you're looking at various different pieces of material it doesn't quite occur to you very often to go oh i should put some octopus tentacles coming out of this person's head uh so you know by by being aware of these 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 different elements you can play with you know you can run through the through them and 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 run them past something you're thinking about painting and go oh yeah that could be kind of bizarre you know so so by considering these elements of painting it opens you up to to perhaps trying something that you wouldn't necessarily have uh thought of so that's um that's the idea behind that so surreal elements are are fun to add and here we have of course brad kunkel again uh and uh he's a big part of uh or big thing for him is is surreal elements and this effect of this texture um he uses quite often to create kind of a surreal uh imagery and then of course there's the metallics in the background and and uh uh and the color scheme which is quite uh, abstract as well that, that takes it away from something more uh something more abstract than real so uh again surreal elements and translucency uh this is something that i i do on a, a fairly regular basis because it it is an interesting visual effect it it creates uh, something that the viewer can can key on. So in this painting, we've got reflections, and we've got you know visual effects with this uh, sort of semi-transparent wings, which adds a certain uh, surreal uh, 
content as well. Uh, so there's a, a number of different um, uh, elements in here that that kind of um, can can create some visual interest. But uh, translucency is something that is kind of fun. Here we've got it going from really almost trans transparent to opaque, uh, right? So it's solid through here. It's not ghosted, but it's it's translucent through here and almost transparent here. So it's, it's something that you can play with to create uh, visual effects. And certainly it works when it comes to uh, surreal imagery, but then also uh, the the painting I, I showed in previous videos of the, the swimming pool um, floaty thing that had a transparent plastic on top and fake plastic on the bottom creates some really interesting visual effects and cast shadows. So translucency is a fun thing to think about and uh, and think if that's something that you want to add to a to an image. And the next element we have, oh, that's just another sample of of translucency. Uh, again, part of my uh, siren series, a little bit about mythology, creates a little bit of a surreal and um, <clears throat> unreal kind of feel, a little bit of mythology type of feel or. Uh, storytelling this creature down here is actually this the um, uh, fossil of a what are they called it's the first uh, the first uh, uh, creature to live on land tetrapod that's a tetrapod uh, so basically it's a lizard with four legs that evolved from that uh, uh, coelacanth that comes in, in in previous videos so that's our our the ancestor of all human life on land uh, so anyway that works its way into the story but um, again translucency effect gives you a little surreal effect and uh, this one here is surface finish uh, when you're painting uh, when I find when I'm painting with um, uh, water mixable stand oil and uh, 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 trying to add retarders to uh, to slow the drying time those added oils create sheen and the sheen uh the shininess of the of the part of that painting uh, uh becomes very glossy and so you've got areas say here where the figure is that that is not glossy and then the outer area where all the dark is becomes shiny so the stuff that's supposed to be dark is now light because it's reflecting light so it's really hard to judge the values and you wind up with this canvas that's got shiny spots and flat spots and then bloody horrible. So I have a cure for this. <laughs> and uh, I use a product uh, called cold wax medium. And uh, it comes it comes in a can. It looks like floor wax. If you remember from the 60s and 70s, the old, uh, you know, wax that they used to put on. Uh, it's a paste wax kind of thing. It's made of beeswax and probably some other stuff in it. And uh, what I do is I take the cold wax medium and I'm going to do a, a video that kind of describes the process and demonstrates it. But cold wax medium and a little bit of um, odorless mineral spirit. Once the painting is dry, apply it with a brush, soft brush. And then I use a, a little little roller and I back roll it to make it all nice and flat. And what happens is that the the surface of the painting becomes completely matte. May not be what you want, but that's not the end of the process. So you matte the surface area, makes it all nice and flat, and you wait a day, and then you take it and you copy stand it, because this is the point where you can photograph, especially on large paintings. This is 36 by 48, and you know if you've got a, a, an area where you photograph your work, on a big painting, you get reflections happening in it and all kinds of crap. So, so making the painting as flat as possible, uh, the finish as flat as possible, gives you the best results in terms of photography. Okay, then you take your photographs. I, I also, uh, at the time, I'll take a photograph, which is a master image. On my camera, I use, uh, I use a Nikon, um, <clears throat> I can't remember the number of it, a digital Nikon, uh, and I take a master shot using uh, raw format. Raw format is not a compression format. 
it's it's the just the raw image uh not jpeg not tiff raw shoot in raw and it creates a file and then you can convert that to tiff and you can convert it to jpeg jpeg is a lossy format and every time you size it in jpeg you lose quality so make a master image using a raw format photograph and and that becomes my master image and i make smaller uh, things for the website and stuff like that from that uh, and then I also turn the painting, this painting, I turn it horizontally and I photograph it in sections in raw format and full resolution. So I'll have a strip on the top and then maybe the top third uh, in this proportion that is full resolution and the center that's full resolution. As long as there's a little bit of overlap between the photos, then I can merge them together to make one big image that may be... Um, because my camera shoots uh, 13 by 20 at 300 DPI uh, dust per inch. And uh, if I want to make a print of it, I need it about three times that resolution, uh, especially if I want to make something large. So by taking a, a photograph in sections and merging them together in Photoshop, I can create one big workable file. Um, so once you've done your photograph, oh, and then here's another thing that I'm doing too now is because more and more sales are happening online, more and more collectors are asking for a video. And since I've got it up on my drawing table, I've got all my specialized lights up. I'll be doing a, a, a video to show you how, how I copy stand. Um, uh, I, I run over the whole thing with the video camera uh, because with the video camera, you can get in close, you can see the detail and you can zoom out. And so, Collectors like to have a good quality video. And once you've got all the lights set up for the copy stand, it's a good time to do the video too. And the painting is still flat, so you don't get reflections uh, happening. Okay. Once you've got all the photography taken care of, then you take a soft brush, like a, a like a shoe polishing brush, and you can buff the surface. And it's a wax. So the, the surface... Uh, the more you buff it, the shinier it gets. So if you've got a painting and if it's for a commission, for instance, and you know where it's going to hang, it's going to hang next to a window. You don't want a lot of sheen or else you're not gonna, the, the owner is not going to be able to see the painting. It'll be all reflection. So you want to have it fairly matte in that application. Most of the time, what I like to do is buff the surface to kind of a, um, if you think about a uh, house painting paint, uh, you uh, I call it a, a satin finish or a pearl finish. It's kind of a little bit shiny, uh, but not glossy. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about it is that it's all completely the same finish. So there's no shiny parts, no flat parts. It's an, a nice, even sheen. And then also you can play with the, the varnish. I can... I tint the varnish sometimes with a, a fairly transparent oil because it's an oil base medium. I'll mix a little bit of, uh, of oil paint in there if I want to try tinting it in a slightly uh, different color so that all the highlights have this wash of, of a particular color and it creates a real color unity in the painting. So you can tint this stuff too. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, cool wax medium. One of the biggest things about it is it, when you're doing water soluble oil and you're uh, uh, doing a painting like this, you can do this painting, let it dry for a couple of weeks. Once it's dry to the touch, you can apply coal wax medium because coal wax medium is a painting medium. It's not a varnish. So uh, if you're uh, doing a traditional varnish, some people recommend that you wait six to eight months to varnish a traditional oil painting. Um, and who's got time for that when your show is six to eight months away. So with this, you can wait a couple of weeks until the, the painting is dry to the touch and you can apply coal wax medium right away. And, and that seals it. Another thing about coal wax medium too, is because it's a painting material. If you decide later, you want to come in and, and change something in the painting, you can paint right over top of the coal wax medium let that dry and then apply another cop coat of coal wax medium to make the, the surface finish even. So I find it uh, the perfect solution and uh, it takes a couple of weeks drying time instead of nine months. So that's, that's a big one, but 
surface finish, definitely something to play with. I think we're almost done here. Oh, there we go. I forgot I put one in here. This is the tinted varnish I was just talking about. So I've taken a little bit of raw sienna, I believe it is, because it's a fairly transparent color, uh, mixed it in with my uh, coax medium. Not much. I make sure that you stir it really, really well because you don't want a lump of raw sienna smeared across the sky. Uh, and uh, and then I apply it again the same way as a soft brush, but it adds a, a, a matching uh, tint of color over all the highlights and over all the colors and over all the sky and creates kind of a, a color harmony uh, to the painting. So tint and varnish is something fun to play with. And I think we're getting close here. Well, of course, this is a presentation. This is that painting labyrinth I was just talking about where uh, one of the characters in the story is searching for one of the other characters that's hidden in the labyrinth was being saved by this creature that had the the octopus uh, tentacles, uh, the uh, minotaur that that is waterbound. So this actually was in uh, uh, what was it um, Arc Salon number fourteen a couple of years ago. This won a, an award, the Haynes Galleries Award. Uh, got to have a show down in Nashville with. The Wyeth family uh, is represented by uh, the Haynes Galleries. Uh, so Andrew Wyeth, Jamie Wyeth, N.C. Wyeth, and and there's a lot of Wyeths um, in the family that paint. And and so I got to actually hang in the gallery with some Andrew Wyeth, which is one of my big uh, uh, mentor type things. So that was kind of fun. But um, presentation in terms of uh, framing, uh, uh, gallery wraps. Um, I don't do a whole lot of exotic framing. Uh, I do most of my paintings with a gallery wrap canvas. So it's got a two inch wide edge. I have a, a particular color that I've chosen. It's a kind of a muted purpley color. It's not black. I want it something with a little bit more richness to it. So it's a, it's a purplish, dark purplish kind of color. I'll probably show it in a demo. And, um, and I put that on the edges. And then if the client wants to add a frame, they can. So in this case here, you can see there's a, I've added a little frame because in this show, uh, you, the work had to be framed. So I added a very simple shadow box frame to this, this painting. Um, clients, if they want to, they can frame the work once they buy it. One of the limitations is that uh, with the two inch deep gallery wrap canvases, your choice of, of frame options is more limited. So that's the drawback. Uh, but if you paint it on a thin three quarter inch stretcher canvas, uh, you are obligated to frame it because it looks like hell if you don't. So this way, I don't have to worry about shipping because the, the frame uh, doesn't add a whole bunch of weight. But here's another thing. Uh, if you're in Canada, like I am, and you're shipping down to the States, uh, the painting is duty free. The frame is not. So you have to go through a broker to to clear the frame and you have to pay duty on it. Uh, so sending it down unframed and having it framed down there, if somebody wants it framed, uh, will save you a lot of hassle at the border. Uh, my dad used to do that a lot when he was showing out of Seattle. He would send his paintings all unframed and they would frame them down there. The, another withdraw oh, another drawback with um, the uh, framing is is you wind up shipping it it adds a lot of weight and they get damaged uh, frames add a lot of weight and package gets heavy and then they get thrown around and the frame breaks and you know frame can be you know something like a frame like this can be you know five six seven eight hundred bucks a thousand bucks and uh, and in one fell swoop it gets broken. So unframed for me, I, I, I find that the best way to go. And if the client wants to frame it, once they get it, that's their choice. Um, yeah, so that's presentation. And I think this is probably the last in the slide. Yeah, here we go. Uh, embellishments. So uh, I've taken to putting my thumbprint on the inside of the frame. I do three in a row because First one's usually too dark, and then there's a medium and a light one. So I put my thumbprint on the frame. And that adds a, a certain 
copyright effect of some kind. And then I do a back label. I uh, have a formatted graphic that I that I change for each uh, or I adapt for each back label. So there's a back label for each painting that talks about me, has a little biography, has the name of the painting, the number of the painting, the year of the painting, and uh, and then a back story about a little uh, summary of the painting on the back label talks about a little bit of a teaser about where it is in the book and stuff like that and uh, and then uh, other embellishments uh, I'm now uh, a lot of galleries and collectors are asking for certificates of authenticity so I, I belong to a, a website uh, called Imprimo and when you enter your work onto Imprimo uh, it's automatically added to the blockchain which guarantees uh, ownership of copyright or it originates the copyright with you. And, uh, and so that becomes important too, because more and more legislation is coming out about royalties for fine artists with music. When you, when you have, or write a song, uh, you can, every time somebody records it, you get royalties. Every time someone sells a record, you get a royalty and, and, uh, and it doesn't happen for fine artists. You sell the painting and then it goes from auction to auction to auction. Everyone makes money off it except the artist. <laughs> so uh, they're talking about trying to uh, enable artists to, or, or even the estates of artists to get a royalty each time it goes to auction. And by having it registered on the blockchain where you've got the copyright locked in, uh, that can make a, a, a big difference in terms of, of locating the original copyright owner uh, or the estate of the copyright. Uh, so that's uh, another embellishment that's happening. Um, what else? I always write uh, the my website, the name of the painting, the number of the painting on the wooden uh, stretcher frame. And uh, and then Bob Gen, my artist friend Bob Gen, he used to include all kinds of little things tucked in the back of the frame maybe a photograph taken on the location that inspired the painting or uh, a little note that he made or a sketch that he did on location or something. So he, he used to be a big uh, fan of, of adding little embellishments that, that uh, engaged the, the owner in um, uh, and, and kept the painting industry uh, interesting. So embellishments are, are a fun thing for the client to, uh, include and, and can ultimately turn into something that may return some money to the artist. So that's, uh, there we go. That's the very last one, I do believe. Let me check here. Uh, yep, that's the end of the slideshow. So that's the, there we go. That's the end of, uh, of my Elements of Painting video series, the 12 videos that I uh, put together in a slideshow to try and describe uh, what I mean by the terms that I'm using. And um, um, I am doing a painting. I've got a painting behind me on the drawing table right now. Uh, oops, on this side back here, my reference material and my drawing ready to go. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a video of this. I've got a camera mounted over my uh, drawing table. And uh, I'm going to do a video, and, and the beginning of the video is uh, going to be looking at the drawing and running through the list, the, the, the elements of painting list. And before I get to the painting aspect of, of, of this project, uh, looking at the different elements of painting and going, do I want to put some of that in there? Can I put some of that in there? Would this work in there? Just running through as a checklist. Because uh, it's hard to remember 66, which is now probably more like 75 different points um, each time. So, so not having to keep it in your head is a good thing. And so, run it past. You run, I'll run this list past the first uh, uh, initial stage, which is the drawing. And then, as I go to painting, I'll maybe refresh myself once I get it all done and transferred down uh, using a, a chalk transfer paper. I'll be demonstrating that. Uh, then I'll um, I'll look at it as I'm beginning the painting and I'll work up my plan of attack, how I want to approach it. Um, what areas do I want to put in first so that the edges aren't going to dry off when I'm uh, uh, starting uh, another area and I don't have to re-wet the edges, which is a bore. 
and and a pain in the ass because you've got to uh, match the color exactly. So I'll be going over the the checklist and various points in the painting. We'll see how the painting evolves, and um, and that'll be the next uh, video series. The the progression and the thinking process uh, involved in in going from uh, the concept, which starts with material and and the composition, all that stuff that happens before the drawing happens, which has already happened in this case, but I've got it all uh, recorded. So um, I'll be able to put that in the next slideshow. So I hope this um, uh, series of uh, uh, elements of uh, painting has uh, been informative and uh, it's come after 42, three years of thinking about this stuff and and uh, and putting it to words instead of uh, just having it happening subconsciously as you're painting. Um, uh, putting it into words uh, so that I could tell people that I was teaching about it um, uh, allowed me to put this list together and and um, and I find it quite useful. So thanks for joining me and uh, I'll hopefully see you on another video. Take care. Oh, www.mheine.com, M-H-E-I-N-E.com. If you want to check out my website, there's a little bit of uh, information about uh, the book. There's a little bit of a, a summary about the book. There's a, a, a rationale about the book, a rationale and a, a location. And uh, well, there's a bunch of, a bunch of stuff on there uh, about the coming book. So uh, if you're interested, uh, have a look. Uh, thanks again. Take care.